Hi and welcome to Magic Numbers. This is episode number 86 and today I'm going to be talking about how do draft formats evolve, uh, mainly focusing on the uh, Lord of the Rings and by mainly I mean exclusively. So we're going to try to see how this format evolved, what changed, how, what implications did it have on the draft, what implications did it have on the metagame and which cards suffer and which cards don't suffer from the metagame evolution and especially which color combinations suffer and which color combinations don't suffer from that kind of uh, situation. But before we move into this, uh, I would like to thank uh, all the people that support um, the podcast. And uh, first and foremost, this is mtjzone.com, who are uh, sponsoring me and uh, helping me with, uh, with the podcast. Uh, second of all, it's you, uh, the patrons. Um, and I have new patrons for this week, so I would like to very, very uh, thank to Francois, Kyle, Maxim, and Andrew, so we have four brand new patrons. Thanks to my last week's um, visit to uh, limited resources, I assume. Uh, so yeah, thanks for joining the team. Um, they uh, will get uh, additional bonuses, including slides to this presentation. After I'm done with it, I'm gonna put them on the Patreon so you can look through them while you listen, uh, or you can just uh, return to them without listening to me. That's a big benefit. You don't have to listen to me. You just need to look through the slides and get the same kind of information. Uh, plus, some other benefits are there, including a question from the listeners, something that no one asked this week, so we're going to skip that segment, but okay. Uh, with that out of the way, let's move to the uh, preamble, which this week is linked to the topic, um, and that is formats change in a subtle way, but subtle small changes adapt to large shifts. And this is the thing that I observed format after format, uh, where there is not a massive difference between week one and uh, week four of the format. Yes, some cards were probably underestimated. They very quickly get picked um, quite high by the 17 lands users. So that thing lasts maybe in a week or two. And after that, it's usually more or less static. Now, this format has been slightly different and we will try to discover why. But most of those times it's, you know, small changes like, oh, this card is picked one pick higher. This card is picked half a pick higher. The problem with that is that very often those cards belong to the same deck. And, you know, changing one card by one pick will not change the metagame at all. But if 16 cards that go into a particular archetype uh, move all in the same directions and are picked higher because it turns out that this archetype is really good, this leads to an archetype switching from being wide open into being probably quite closed. And it's because of that it's hard to look at the data and say, oh, wow, this one is really cut. Uh, most of the time, people that draft a lot will figure it out by observing the pods they are in and noticing that they are cut off from some color. But of course, these type of observations are prone to particular situation bias. You want to play six drafts and you will be cut from black six times and you think, oh, black is completely cut. Eh, and then you look into the data and say, actually, black is quite open. Probably you were just in the wrong seats in the wrong pods with wrong cards being opened and, and you were a bit unlucky. Um, so uh, there are ways of looking at um, how those changes add up. And that's one of the analysis I usually do in the first weeks of the format when I look at the openness of the color and basically try to see how many good cards will you see per pod um, in a particular color combinations and how do those shift uh, will give you a good information on what is being more cut and what is being more open. But that is not everything that is in there. It's just that some decks are much more susceptible to uh, slight changes in the metagame and some decks are not. And we're going to look at two cases of such a situation today um, because it all depends on what is the nature of a particular deck. And I'm going to move to that during my main presentation. So uh, I think that this is enough for the preamble and let's move to the actual uh, main topic. Before we do that, um, I am doing my new segment, Metagame Evolution, where I'm just going to show you how does the uh, top 10, well, top uh, two color archetypes for the color, uh, for the for the format look like uh, in the last week. I'm looking at, actually I'm looking at last 10 days because I didn't have a, a podcast last week due to my uh, LR visit. But what has changed is um, a week ago, Rakdos was at around 58.7% win rate and that dropped to 56.9, which means that yes, Rakdos is still for every week so far, as for every week so far, is still the most winning archetype in the format. 
but the difference now is pretty small. And I would actually say that there are four good archetypes uh, present right now. And that's Rakdos, it Demir, and Orzov. They are all within 56.9 to 55.9, within one percentage point from each other. Then we have a transition archetypes in Golgari, Boros, and Azorius, uh, which have between 55 and 53.5% win rate. I think of importance, Boros uh, has dropped quite significantly in terms of, um, in terms of uh, where it is. Uh, I think large part of it is um, the rise of Izzet and the high draft rate of Izzet, which steals one of the key cards for Boros that made it so good in the first weeks, uh, namely uh, Rally at the Hornburg. Uh, that's been plucked by the Izzet mages and to some extent by Rakdos mages. And because of that, Boros doesn't have access to it as, uh, as often as it did in the first week when it had a win rate of around 58%. And because of this one card that it doesn't have any access to anymore, um, it dropped significantly because the two drops in red and white are not so good. And uh, the whole strength of the deck in the first weeks was dependent on that one particular card being wildly open. You could pick three of those uh, easily in every draft, and then your Boros deck was all of a sudden busted. Now that you can maybe get one, if you're lucky, uh, all of a sudden Boros just doesn't exist. So uh, yeah, go into Boros when you pick your rallies at the Hornburg. Uh, and then three archetypes that are significantly below everything else uh, at around 52%, and that's Selesnya, Simic, and Gru. These were poor from the start and continue being poor. I think that right now they just are significantly lapped by everything else. So that's the um, metagame evolution for this week. Small changes, and um, I'm expecting that maybe before the format is finished, that we're going to see a week where Ragdos is not actually a number one archetype anymore. And that's going to be an interesting moment. Although if people stop drafting Ragdos, I think that um, the nature of that archetype and the strength of the cards that are in there mean that as soon as people stop drafting it a bit, it's going to skyrocket back again into the uh, top contender. Um, right. So first, a bit of my speculation. I did this slide before I started any analysis. So that was my sort of understanding of how formats evolve based on the data analysis uh, analysis I, I did in the previous format. And um, I would say that there's like five stages of the format evolution. One, there is a founding effect, and that's how people approach the format when they start first playing it in the first couple of days. Then there is the abuse stage, um, and that's the moment when uh, the grinders, the content consumers, especially data-driven content consumers, figure out that there is the deck that is the best, and that is the deck that you have to uh, draft at all costs. Uh, and they start abusing that uh, gap in the um, uh, in the metagame, and, and that's where the win rates of 17 Lens users are really high most of the time. Then there is the catch-up stage, where less invested drafters start drafting the most absurd strategy for the particular uh, format. And um, because of that, that strategy becomes less viable and also less successful most of the time. Um, that's the moment when uh, top grinders are starting to look for solutions to uh, uh, to that slump and, and they try to figure out alternative strategies. Um, then you usually have a solution response, which means uh, enough content creators figured out alternative solutions to the um, uh, to the format and people start learning from them by watching their streams, by looking at data, um, by figuring out on their own. And, and at this moment, people just um, figure out uh, what to do to win the most when the best strategy is cut. And sometimes it's find a new strategy and sometimes they just go back to the original one because it's so good that you just continue uh, forcing it, knowing that your win rate is going to suffer. And at this solution response uh, stage, usually the metagame is stable. So cards are being picked at a steady rate. The pick orders don't change from that moment most of the time. And we finally reach the stagnation phase. And this, this is the most interesting phase, at least should be the most interesting phase for uh, people that truly love limited. Because there you enter the stage where you need to be very responsive. You need to know everything about the format. You need to adapt and you need to be flexible in your drafts because you know at least four or five different ways of uh, being super successful in the draft. And the riddle is to position yourself as best as possible uh, to win the most, knowing that you're playing against people who know what to do, 
know the cards. Uh, there won't be any freebies anymore. Uh, most of the people that draft are invested at that stage. So um, this is the trickiest part of the format most of the time. Um, so I think that every one of those um, stages has a different set of skills that you need to acquire to be good in those stages. And starting with the founding effect, because you never played the uh, format before, I think that the most important things that you need to get to be good in that part is your own card evaluation or someone else's card evaluation, which means you need to get information from people that evo uh, evaluate cards very well. And this, of course, means like watching good set reviews, um, um, figuring your own pick orders, trying to think about how you build your decks, building those uh, archetype skeletons uh, that I promote so adamantly uh, uh, in the pre-release uh, stage of the format. Uh, and if you are there, you have a head start because you thought about things. You know which cards will work together with each other. You know that uh, certain cards are, well, trusted content creators tell you that they're going to be busted or very good. And uh, if you know all those things, you're going to have a huge advantage over people that just pick up the cards and start drafting. And there's plenty of those people. So uh, you're going to have a big advantage by uh, doing the you know homework before the format is released. At the abuse stage, well, the key <laughs> boarded window was one of the misses, uh, a very rare misses in evaluation from a particular content creator industry, as Mercurio noticed in the chat. So the key steps in, uh, in achieving success in that stage is first your own observation. If you start playing the first draft, this is the moment when you start getting those eureka moments. So basically you see, Ooh, that card beat me like four times in a row. I think that there is something into it. Like, um, I think that that was my first um, first moment when I realized Whisper Squad from Ikoria was a good card. It's just like I pl someone played it against me and I said that card is just rubbish, and then they beat me, and then another person beat me. And I'm like, hmm, probably not rubbish. Probably I'm just rubbish in evaluating cards. Um, and I started playing it, and it was all good. Um, and also, this is the moment when you should source your knowledge. Uh, this is the moment to watch streamers who are known uh, for abusing those kind of early uh, strategies. And um, if you know them, you will find them. Uh, and if you find them, then you basically uh, can jump on that bandwagon very early, get your wins, abuse the uh, early system as much as possible. This is the time when you can actually boost your collection because you're drafting against majority of people who still don't know what you're doing. And if you are the one that knows what they are doing in the pod, um, you're going to win quite a lot. Um, then there is the sketchup stage. And the sketchup stage, the characteristic of it is this is the moment when people who are not like hardcore content consumers, uh, but consume some content, are going to be starting catching up. Uh, people who don't draft five times every day, but that draft maybe, you know, like a couple of times a week, are going to start to catch up on their own observation as well. This is the moment when mainstream knowledge uh, catches up with this arcane exclusive knowledge of uh, uh, degenerates who consume way too much uh, content and who um, and who play way too much. Uh, and this is the moment when also the biggest shifts in the meta game uh, happen because, of course, not everyone can sit shotgun in the car uh, if there is only you know one seat only one person can take it if six people try to seat some sit next to the driver something bad is going to happen with the car so this is the moment when all of a sudden the main strategy becomes completely lo unlocked uh, and in in some cases this is the moment when you have to be ready and jump ship and figure out what is the next best thing and that's the moment when the solution response uh, uh, stage starts and this is all about finding empty niches. And here, the answer to filling empty niches is diversity. And this is the moment when at least seven different streamers will swear by the uh, by a particular archetype that they say they have broken. And, um, and they can be all right, because probably there are several solutions uh, possible. So uh, if let's say Ragdos is not working in Lord of the Rings because both red and black are overdrafted. Um, there will be people who will find the Legends deck. There will be people that find the Izzet deck. There will be people that find um, some kind of um, 
I don't know, uh, supplement black with green or supplement um, uh, red with white and, and, and figure out those kind of decks. This is the moment when people will find their particular builds based on cards that are underpicked but powerful. Um, and very often those decks will be highly synergy driven uh, rather than power driven. And the last stage, the stagnation, I wrote the very, very useless term, abuse of stochastic effects. Uh, but actually what it means is stochastic effects are random things that happen uh, during a particular process. In draft, stochastic effects is in some pods, black red is going to be open. In some pods, blue black is going to be open. In some pods, white green legends is going to be open. And you need to be attentive, you need to know, you need to have a huge variety uh, of tricks and try to uh, use them accordingly. This is the moment when versatility and all the knowledge that you gained in the first four stages, plus being able to navigate drafts flawlessly is going to make or break uh, your win rate. And I do know that there are lots of people who are very good in the abuse stage, but have a problem transitioning to that stagnation phase because they invest way too much effort into learning that uh, one trick pony kind of um, uh, strategy of abusing the best archetype. But once that one is off the table, they have problem in navigating the drafts because you cannot just semi-force the best strategy. You need to be way more flexible. You need to incorporate drafting the hard way. You need to reevaluate your priorities. So if you draft with preference, your preferences should change. All those things are going to be um, very important in the last stage. And I think that the last stage is when truly the best of the best players are going to uh, have extremely high win rates. And if you don't have uh, your very high win rate in the dying stages of the format, that probably means that you have still a lot to learn in terms of draft navigation and, um, uh, and using versatile strategies. So yeah, that is my theory for today. And now let's move a bit to Lord of the Rings and how it evolved. And first of all, I looked at the, uh, at the data from all the players. I'm going to look a bit at um, all the players and a bit at the top and the bottom tier. But this is based on all the players. And I think the interesting thing that happened during the format, I divided it into six weeks because the format has been with us for six weeks already uh, and a bit even. Um, and what you can see is that uh, as the format progressed, in week one, 71% of the decks were two-color dot, uh, and 20% were uh, two-color with a splash, and like around 7% of the decks were uh, three-color with or without flash, I wrote, but I meant splash. Um, so it was markedly over 90% of the decks were two-colors or two-colors with a splash. As the format progressed, uh, the number or the, the frequency of the uh, two color decks dropped significantly. Uh, week three, it's only 65%. Uh, week five, it's 59. Now it's still 59%. But uh, the drop is generally from 71% to 59% in week six. At the same time, obviously, since uh, fewer decks are just pure two color decks, um, the two color decks with splash increased from 20% through 24, 28, roughly 28 right now. Um, and at the same time, uh, the three color decks with or without splash, uh, went from 7% to 12%. So almost doubled in, uh, in frequency. Um, and this means, um, I don't know if it's strictly, uh, typical for the cycle of a set Funderwung. I think that this is very typical for a set where there is a very dominant, um, a very dominant um, archetype or very dominant shard slash wedge. And I think that this is the case here. I think that uh, the drop in two color decks um, and uh, increase of two color decks with splash or three color decks is mainly driven by the fact that people want to be in Grixis colors and they start in Grixis, try to defend it for quite long. And uh, once they can't defend, um, um, uh, once they can't defend it, uh, they just move into their third color. Um, they first start with splashes, then later may move into uh, full three color decks. Hey, Jamie Topples, um, welcome. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, 
this is maybe not going to happen in every format, but in this format definitely did. Um, uh, two color decks in those dominant Grixis colors were not available uh, after several weeks. And because of that, uh, there is a big drop in, um, in purely two color decks and increase in splashing and, and playing three colors. What do we have next? Um, so at the same time, I looked at um, all the archetypes that were played and, 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 and how do they change. This graph is a bit, bit messy, but um, um, start looking at it. Uh, these are the less played uh, two color archetypes and what fraction of the decks were they uh, during those during the, each week. Um, and we can look at Selesnya, it started at 4%, but very quickly dropped to 2% and now is around 1.5%. So there was a drop of, of uh, how often people play Selesnya. Uh, Simic, similar situation, started around 4%, dropped to 2 Two percent. Now it's at one percent, even so, it almost disappeared uh, over the course of the uh, of the format. Now, um, Golgari is a deck that started low at three and a half, and it still dropped to three, but then stable um, uh, level all through the six week at around three percent uh, of the decks, which means that Golgari is not a popular deck, but it's a deck that people are not afraid of drafting. With the other ones, you can see that the, the, the drop off was uh, was well almost like by factor of four or three. Um, Azori's similar situation to an extent uh, started at three and a half, then dropped to three. Now it's around two. So yeah, similar to what happened to Selesnya. And Gru was never popular. Started at one point six, and now it's at zero point eight. So um, yeah. Um, it's not it's not looking good. So from that graph, I would say that out of those five um, less drafted decks, Golgari is the only one that stood the test of time and people are still willing to draft it at a lower rate because it's not as powerful as the other things and there are risks involved with both black being slightly closed and, and green not being as powerful as you would uh, think. So yeah. Uh, when we look at the three contending colors, because I will... At this stage of the format, I can say uh, black, red, and blue, red are just markedly stronger than anything else. Uh, but those three are still very strong um, uh, as contenders. Boros did drop off, as I mentioned, mainly because uh, mainly because um, um, the lack of accessibility to the uh, Rally at the Hornberg uh, is hurting it quite a lot and no good two drops in the colors apart from that. Uh, but the other two are pretty strong. You can see that both that, that ores of dropped instantly. So like started at 10%, went to 9, 8, 7. It's now around 7%. Um, Boros also started dropping, uh, started at 9, dropped to 7, 6.5, this, this range. And uh, Demir, on the other hand, started lowish at 7.3% of the decks, uh, then went up 8, 9, 9.3%, 9 and now stabilized at around 9. So this is one of those decks that, as the format progressed, became more and more popular. Um, and that's, I think, the first case that we see like this, that actually in week 6, it has a higher play rate than, um, uh, than in week uh, 1. Um, especially important because we know that two color decks in general just dropped uh, across the board. We're Arstal, we're going to get to the uh, Izzet because that's the interesting part. Uh, here we see both uh, Ragdos and Izzet. Uh, Ragdos was the most popular from the get go. 19.2% uh, of the decks were Ragdos and that continued for two weeks, then started dropping. And it dropped to 17.3, 15%. Now it's at around 14%. Uh, Izzet, on the other hand, Started 9%, moved to 11%, 12.5%, 14.5%, and now it's at 15%. So actually, week six is the first week where uh, is it is uh, the most drafted deck uh, from the two-color combination, which also means it's the most um, drafted deck in the format. Uh, more drafted than Ragdos, despite having a slightly uh, lower win rate, as we saw in the metagame update. So 
you can see how um, people switched from uh, abusing Ragdos in week one into uh, basically trying to draft as much as possible um, of Izzet decks. Um, is it is not deep enough to support that draft rate? Well, the point is this: these numbers come from 17 lands users, which are only a fraction of all the players. So yes, if all the players would be drafting is it as highly, probably it wouldn't be enough to support it. But because it's only a fraction of the people that sort of went on that is it strategy and other people maybe didn't catch up with it, um, because you, you can see that maybe the draft rates of certain cards that are key for is it did not uh, did not drop uh, uh, when you look at the alpha. So when you look at how all the users uh, are drafting, um, I think that there is still um, there is still potential for is it to be drafted. And I think that you know the win rate of is it across the last couple of weeks did not uh, drop by much. So people are still winning with is it decks even though it's drafted more. Um, Funderbung, I wonder how much the rise of is it is that it has a favorable matchup against Ragdos. I think that there is a good part of it, uh, but I will be talking about the reasons why that happens, uh, in my opinion, uh, for the next couple of slides, basically. Okay, so um, I looked at the win rates and frequency of the deck play uh, across um, across all the 17 lands users. But if you know anything about 17 lands data, you can also look at the data of the different player tiers. And those player tiers, um, just to explain to those that maybe are less accustomed with the 17 lands data, they relate to the win rates of those players. So uh, top tier players are the players with the highest win rates um, and also the highest win rates that they have um, um, that they have across multiple formats. So basically to be in the top tier in the last three formats, you needed to have uh, a win rate that is within this top tier. And that's roughly 60%. Um, bottom tier players, they had to play at least the last three uh, formats. So they have to be players that are regular um, drafters. And also their uh, their win rate has to be uh, significantly lower than the, of the top Tier players. So, like top tier players have roughly 60%, maybe 61% average win rate. Um, bottom tier players have around 48% win rate. That's the, that's the rough numbers. So, I tried to look at are there differences between how those two uh, type of players um, 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 draft different types of decks. And first thing that I noticed is that in the first two weeks, top tier players were just really much higher on strictly two color decks. And that's something to do with possibly skill. Um, it's probably that if you know how to evaluate cards, if you consume a lot of content in those first two weeks, you know exactly which cards go into the which deck. And because of that, uh, and because of the fact that you know that the best color combinations are still open, you're just going to go directly for them and draft as much as possible and um, um, uh, of, of those two color decks, and you're always going to end up with enough playables because you know you pick the uh, strong color pairs and they are open, so uh, you will see enough cards to just play the two color deck. Uh, while the bottom tier players, first of all, they have a higher natural tendency to splash. I've shown that in previous seminars, and um, uh, bottom tier players do like their splash, even though uh, sometimes it's not necessary. And also, sometimes they will end up in drafts that don't turn out uh, so well for them. Uh, and because of that, they will be forced to splash rather than choose to splash. So all those two things um, add up. And you know, you may think five percentage points difference because you know top tier players in the week one, two have seventy four percent of the time we're playing two color decks, and it's only sixty nine percent for the bottom tier. Those five percent of decks is quite a lot because um, you know you end up in the splash decks always have a well. In most formats, splash decks have lower win rate, and if you end up five percent, uh, uh, five percent points more into those uh, lower win rate uh, decks, you're going to have a lower win rate just because of that, just because of your draft navigation. That's not taking into account that probably there are also differences in your play skill between the top players and you, and you're going to uh, lose extra on that. So um, 
I try to make my podcast focusing on improvement from uh, the bottom tier players because I think that they have the most to gain from the data, but also at the same time, they are very frequently the ones that use the data the least. Um, so one thing that I will highly encourage if you think you might be in this bottom tier, and that's you know usually uh, people that are beginning how to learn to learn how to play limited. I think it's very important for you to, uh, at least in uh, in those early weeks, try to figure out what is good and try to um, adhere to it and try to make sure that you end up with a solid two-color deck and try to make sure that uh, all the cards in your deck are at least decent because that's another problem of uh, bottom-tier players having too many of those 23rd playables. You know, 23rd playable is called 23rd playable because you want to put it as your 23rd card. You don't want to put it as a card number 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 23, because then you end up with decks that just don't have too many of those uh, low impact cards and you're going to have games when you draw too many of them and then um, and then you're going to lose games because of that. Uh, but as you see, uh, across time, uh, the rate of um, drafting uh, two color decks converges. So uh, we have this big five percentage point difference in the first two weeks. Uh, but at week five, they converge. They are both at around 58. Um, and week six, also 58, 59% um, uh, of the time, uh, both tiers of the players draft two color decks. So a big decrease uh, in uh, the top tier players. They still maintain a high win rate because, again, it's not something I can tell you from data, but I can guess from the data. They don't draft those... Um, uh, two color and splash decks because they have to and they are forced to play a splash, uh, but because they elect to do it because they want to be in the strongest color combination. And sometimes the only way to be able to be in the stronger color combination is to um, splash because you know that that way you can keep a high quality of the cards and you sacrifice a bit of consistency uh, rather than, um, uh, rather than uh, just try to draft something and then try to put extra cards from a different color because you just didn't get enough uh, playables. So these are splashes by design of how you navigate your draft rather than splashes by um, um, splashes by necessity of uh, you being forced to put some extra cards or put some really, really bad cards in your colors just to make it on playables. Um, in terms of two color and splash decks play frequency, um, there were not big difference. Uh, there is a small maybe um, advantage of the bottom tier players uh, playing those uh, splash decks in the first couple of weeks. And uh, it may be slightly flipped in the last couple of weeks, but these differences are quite small. So now after being invaded by my cat before, now I'm being invaded by my dog. Thank you very much, animals. You're very, you're credit to the forest. I'm really happy that my leaf insect is stuck in this cage and cannot interrupt my stream. Um, so nothing interesting really to see here, except for the fact that um, the rate of playing two color splash decks uh, increased in both cases uh, as the format progressed. Um, so if we don't see a big difference in two colors and splash, um, but we did see a big difference in to color deck um, uh, play frequency. That means that um, bottom tier players, they do play more of the three color decks. And this goes across the board. Um, in week one, bottom tier players play 10% of their decks were, um, uh, were three color, uh, while it was only 5.6% for uh, top tier players. And this sort of stayed across the board every single week that we look at. Uh, bottom tier players played more of those three color decks. Um, in some formats, it's not going to be like this, but uh, especially in formats that support three color play, but this is not one of those. So um, here you should be aiming at playing two color decks and top tier players know that they will play three color decks when it's an absolute necessity or because there is an odd archetype that they are happy to play three colors in like some sort of um, green based legend decks with uh, great hole of the Citadel. Um, still, even though they had to increase uh, how often they play three color decks because of the uh, challenge that uh, drafting strictly two color decks is um, in, a, in, a, in a meta game when 
everyone wants to be red or black. Uh, it's still only increased to 10.9%, and uh, bottom tier players, they still play 14.4% of the three-color decks um, uh, at week six. So the difference stayed, even though it decreased at some stages, every single uh, week of the format, bottom tier players drafted the three-color decks more frequently. Uh, right. Um, how did it look uh, with Ragdos? Um, as the format progressed. And here you can see exactly what I was talking about. So uh, for the raid people, especially, um, I found that there are those five, well, I speculate that there are those five stages of uh, format evolution. First, there is the founding effect before the set is released, when you get your evaluation from set reviews and um, uh, your own attempts of set review. Then there is the abuse stage when um, one color uh, combination is best uh, and people, and it's still open because not everyone knows it. And people just jump on that bandwagon and try to uh, draft it as much as possible. Then there's the catch up stage when that diminishes. Then there is a solution response when people try to find alternatives. And the stagnation when uh, everything is basically uh, available from all the previous stages. And you have to be flexible and figure out in each draft what is the best strategy in that particular situation. Um, so this is this abuse stage. Uh, the first two weeks of the format, top tier players were drafting Ragdos 27.6% of the time, 25% of the time. Um, then the bottom tier players only played at 18, 19% of the time. Um, and then the top players, they steadily decreased how often they play Ragdos. It went from 27, 25, 22, 18, and now it's at 16% while the drafting rate of Ragdos for the bottom tier players stayed more or less the same. So it's like 18, 19, 18, 17, 19 right now. And right now, actually, the bottom tier players draft Ragdos more frequently uh, than, um, than the top tier players. So here we have uh, a difference in um, adaptation to the evolution of the format. Top tier players, they knew when Ragdos was open and they just basically went for it hard. 27% of the decks, of all the decks that were drafted being Ragdos, is a lot. 25% is still a massive number. Because you have to keep in mind, this not doesn't only look at the two-color decks. This looks at all co possible combinations. So quarter of all the decks were Ragdos, in, and that includes all the three-color ones, all the four-color ones. There was a question in the chat about how about four-color decks. They are a fraction of a percentage. So um, uh, they don't play any role in this format. They were like 0.3% of the decks are four color. Um, some of them might be two color with multiple splashes because that's how 17 lands looks at the data. Um, so yeah, um, you can see top tier players draft Ragdos when it's open and reduce it as it's being challenged. Bottom tier players are not flexible. They started drafting lower than they probably should have and they stayed with it probably for longer than they should have, and they are drafting it at the high, two highest rate. Uh, Central, what does the Legends deck count as? So the question is basically, you know, 17 Lens has to classify things, and it's always arbitrary, and, and there is never a perfect solution when there is arbitrary stuff involved. Um, any deck that has under three cards of a particular color counts that color as a splash. So frequently we'll have, uh, let's say, a green white deck because most of the cards are green and white and maybe there are two splashed red cards two splashed black cards two splashed blue cards that will count as a white a green deck with three splashes but it will still count as a two color deck with splash and if you have over three color cards uh, in a particular uh, splashed color it will count, count as a three color deck yeah um now let's look at how uh, is it uh, developed and uh, bottom tier started at 10.7%. Uh, top tier players started at 12% uh, drafting. Is it so we're relatively similar, actually, you know, like one percentage point difference. Um, but already at week two, the difference jumped from um, those two percentage points to five percentage points. So um, uh, bottom tier players drafted at roughly 12% of the time, uh, top tier players roughly 17% of the time. And um, Top tier players started drafting more and more. So it would go to 18, 20, 24 currently. Uh, um, so yeah, they basically, as they weaned off um, 
Ragdos, they started drafting, um, they started drafting Is it? Um, bottom tier players, they did increase their uh, frequency of drafting Is it, but not to the extent that top tier players did. So we had a one percentage points difference here. Uh, at week two, we had five percentage difference uh, points difference, and now we have seven percentage point difference uh, with um, uh, with uh, seventeen percent of the de decks of the bottom tier players being is it and twenty four being uh, uh, of the top tier. And week five, it was even more. It was like nine percentage points difference, so uh, fifteen percent uh, for bottom tier and twenty four point five for the top tier. So all of those things uh, show that top tier players they do consider the meta game and they do abuse the gaps in it. That's a big part of the skill because being able to do that does not require you to be able to play the game extremely well. Even if you are a player who, like me, struggles with gameplays on occasions, uh, you can still catch up a lot of the gap between you and the top technical players uh, by knowing exactly when to position yourself. And this is a much easier way to bridge your gaps. And this is a much easier way of making sure that you uh, trophy enough, that you uh, don't hammer gems on drafts, that you are capable of, you know, like playing sort of free if you don't draft uh, five times a day. Um, so yeah, uh, knowing how the metagame flows and where should you be putting your preferences, because, you know, I'm not going to tell you that you should be forcing, is it? But I'm telling you that in those last three weeks, you should probably be able to... Um, Draft as though ending in is it is a good thing. So you maybe start with the red card if you have a close choice between a red and a black card. Uh, you may pick a blue common over white common when you see that they are similar power level. And all those small decisions will put you towards being an is it without forcing it. Because, you know, if you don't see the right card, you're still not going to end up there. But if you see the right situation, you're going to be much more likely in it because you're going to be from the position from the get-go positioning yourself in, in a situation when you are going to end up uh, being an asset drafter. Um, um, I'm using the um, data that is publicly available at all times. Uh, so I'm not using any scrapers. Uh, this question from the chat. I'm not scraping any data. I can have certain access to the data that people don't, but I decide not to use it because then I think I don't want to get uh, unfair advantage. I only use those kind of privileges when I'm doing personal data of, 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 of a guest. So yeah, um, uh, because those data are not available publicly. And then, you know, if I invite someone to analyze, actually, I did the episode with Jamie. If you can go to my YouTube, uh, there is uh, that episode. It was a great one. And then I had to access uh, strictly Jamie, Jamie, Jamie's um, uh, data and then um, uh, 17 lands were kind enough to grant me that kind of uh, access. But all this stuff is available on the website or in the public data sets, uh, so everyone can take it. Um, all right. Um, now let's look at how people were playing Demir. And um, here we see a slightly different uh, trend. Um, again, Top tier players were slightly higher on Demir in the first week, two percentage points difference, 11% uh, for top tier and 9% for uh, bottom tier players. And the bottom tier players, they sort of increased together with the top tier players until week three. And then we see a slight drop off. So uh, as they were 14% in week three, it dropped to 13 in week four and five, and then 12% in week six. At the same time, top players, they stuck with playing Demir. Uh, and, you know, they went from 11 to 13, 14, 15, and now we're stuck at 15.5. So uh, here we see a slightly different dynamic, and I don't know how to exactly to explain this uh, weaning of Demir by, um, by um, bottom tier players. One explanation would be that the obvious cards for Demir are cut, and the top tier players can play with the more complicated cards and, and build decks of... Um, uh, uh, build decks that are uh, still strong, but only when you are a very good technical player. While uh, the bottom tier players, they went, Demir, especially week three, I think was atrociously open. and You could abuse uh, that strategy quite well. 
Um, now you just don't wield those mouths of Sauron and um, and cards like that, and it becomes a bit more tricky to play a Demir deck, but it's still possible if you know certain builds. I think that in this moment, um, if you are a player that doesn't see the solution to the Demir decks, this is the moment when you uh, go to content creators that routinely draft Demir and look what they are doing and how do they uh, navigate their games. And then maybe you can find inspiration how to draft the mirror slightly differently than the um, than the obvious versions from week two and three when the color was very open and color pair was very open. Um, yes, uh, cent central. I unfortunately I wanted to do those graphs with win rates and I didn't do them in the end. Now I regret it because it would be nice to show also the evolution of the win rates of each of those color pairs uh, over the weeks. Uh, if, you, if you watch the first five minutes of my last seminars, I tried to put weekly win rate of every color combination uh, across the board. I mean, you can see you can see that uh, Demir is doing pretty well in, uh, in week six, because that's from the last week. It has 56.3 win rate, comparable with Izzet and Rakdos. So uh, despite being drafted quite a lot by the top players, it's still, um, uh, it still has a high win rate. Do you think there is a correlation with the color risers and players acclimating to tempting the ring? Uh, I think there is, especially in Is it? I think especially in Is it, um, the ring tempting is a very important part of why this color combination is still good, even though it's overdrafted by the top players. Uh, now let's look at Boros. Uh, Boros uh, started equally by bottom players and top tier players. I find it also that aggressive strategies like strictly aggro decks uh, are going to be preferred by the bottom tier players. Also, I found in the data that for a very good reason, uh, bottom tier players are having much more success with aggressively uh, slanted decks and aggressively slanted strategies. I think it playing aggressive decks, although by no means an easier strategy to implement. I think that playing aggressive decks at a very high level requires a tremendous amount of skill, but it is more forgiving to mistakes. Uh, your strategy usually has fewer choices. Those choices are partially easier. You don't uh, get uh, faced with important uh, strategy lines that will make keep you alive for seven turns like you will do in some controlling mid-range uh, strategies. Um, so because that simplicity of the plan and um, and fewer places where you can make play mistakes, uh, those decks play better with the bottom tier players. So if you think, because it's a very important to self-evaluate yourself, if you are a player of, you know, like win rate with around 50%, maybe 52, maybe 48, if you are one of those players, it's good for you to know that probably you're going to do better with the aggressive decks because you can position yourself slightly to be drafting those kind of strategies more. And over time, you will figure out how to play the more uh, complicated strategies, no problem. It's just that sometimes uh, copying content creators that play, you know, Sun Black is an excellent example. Uh, I don't know how many people in the world will be able to play the decks that Sun Black is drafting to, to the same success as he is because getting success with his deck requires a really high level of, uh, of gameplay. Uh, and um, I don't have it. I don't even try to draft some of his decks. I position myself, look, I can copy uh, Ham TV's decks and I can play them and I can have good success with them. Not because they are easier to play. Well, they present you with fewer key decisions at every stage, I think. Um, and because of that, I'm uh, better at copying them. Even though, you know, both of those players will play Bath Song, which I see in the chat, um, very happily. It's just that also Sam Black likes to play Bath Song with some inexplicable combination of weird commons and somehow it works for him but it won't work for everyone. Whilst Ham just prefers to play the Bath Song with, uh, you know, more straightforward spell strategy. Um, uh, that either is circling around the uh, tempted by the ring, or it's trying to, uh, or is trying to finish off with one of the spells payoffs. That's fine. Um, but okay, with that digression, um, 
On week one, bottom and top tier are roughing at exactly the same rate, 10 and a half percent. But then we start seeing a big discrepancy. So um, the bottom tier players uh, continue drafting Boros at a high rate, you know, 11.5, 11 percent uh, weeks two and three. Then it starts dropping off slightly, but uh, you know, we still have nine, eight percent uh, of the decks that they draft are Boros. While with top tier players, instantly almost they stop drafting uh, Boros. Um, um and uh well stopped uh, started drafting it much less it dropped to nine percent 7.2 6.5 5.3 and last week it was 6.3 so you know like stabilizing at around six percent for the last three weeks uh so there is a big drop off and uh, again i think that part of it is the newfound love for is it um and the other part is um if you are drafting uh Rally at the Hornberg, which you should be drafting with if you want to be in Boros, you might as well uh, pair it with the spells from uh, Is it rather than with uh, aggressive white creatures from Boros, because that strategy is just slightly better, and I think it's also more accessible. So um, it's uh, probably good to keep Boros as your emergency lane when the blue is not open, uh, but you probably want to draft it anyway, like a red-based deck with uh, Rally of the Hornbrook and some spells. And then um, if blue is really, really cut, then you can pivot into Boros rather than Boros being your preferred archetype. And because Boros is not your preferred archetype, you're going to end up less in it. Not because it's necessarily that much weaker, but because the preferences, uh, they will you know, small edges uh, uh, will be important for you. I wonder if there is a correlation with more people playing and liking Black Breath and the decrease in Boros. Uh, it will be very hard to find the deterministic um, uh, data that, that points to it. The, there might be that a uh, couple of those cards that punish the one ones uh, are uh, problematic for Boros, and that's one of the reasons. Um, but I am not sure. I don't have the data to support it. But yes, it's true that uh, Black Breath is one of the cards that saw much more play uh, across the weeks three, four, five, six. It doesn't hurt Is it though, but of course, Is it has a slightly different plan. So yeah. In terms of Orzov, um, top tier players started actually quite high on Orzov, with almost fifteen percent of the decks in the first week were Orzov because Black was so open. And instantly, as the black started being overdrafted, uh, this started decreasing to 11, 10, 9 percent. Right now, it's at eight. Uh, while bottom tier players started less um, aggressively on Orzov at 11 percent, so four percentage points roughly difference, and it's stuck at 11 percent until week four. And now it's currently starting to drop off to 10, 9 percent because black has really been uh, contended in the last couple of weeks. So again, here we see. Um, bottom tier players not adapting to the meta game um, as aggressively as uh, the top tier players do. Here again, you could see that Ors of I I did have uh, several trophy decks in Ors of in the first weeks, and I can't get for the love of it back into that archetype anymore. So I almost uh, never drafted right now. Uh, I can see myself in this data that basically. I can't get into the right ors of uh, deck uh, at the moment, and because of that, I don't draft it. So I think that that is the fate of many top players. Why it dropped from fifteen percent to eight. Uh, and the last archetype I wanted to show is uh, is Simic, uh, and that's because bottom tier players loved Simic in the first week, and this has to do something with the partial mentality of people that are in the bottom tiers are either beginners or play longer but uh they want to do certain things and they want to feel the rush rather than maximize their win rate and there's nothing wrong with that and i think that simic was the deck that at least promised on paper this kind of feeling when you play a bunch of scry things and things go bigger and then you put counters and you scry more and 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 you draw lands and put them into play it all offered like this nice A plus B kind of strategy. And those A plus B strategies are very appealing. And because they are very appealing, um, certain players will gravitate towards them. Uh, first week, 7.6% of the bottom tier decks were uh, Simic. Only 3.2% of the top tier players' decks were Simic. This 
dropped uh, already in week two. Uh, bottom tier only had 5.3, so 2.3 percentage point drop. Uh, and then it dropped to around 4%. Now it's around 3%. So um, um, there is a drop, but it took some time and it still lingered at a quite high rate. While the top tier players um, started at 3.2 and instantly dropped to 2.3, 2.5, 2, 2.2. 2 it will happen, you know, um, once every 50 draft for them, but, uh, but no more than that. And it was consistent all through the format while uh, the bottom tier players adapted to the fact that Simic uh, strategy just doesn't work uh, uh, in a much slower way. So, um, yeah. Uh, another example how lack of adaptation to, uh, to what format is offering has led to potentially a, a lower uh, win rate. Uh, okay. Now I'm going to move to the... Mm, second to last segment of the seminar, uh, we're going to look at the openness of the color and the impact on the win rate, and also the nature of the color pair um, and how does it impact things. We're going to look at only two color pairs, so don't worry, it's not going to be like hours of uh, me blabbing. But um, using the data that is available from 17 Lens, you can sort of estimate what will be the average number of good cards you will see in a draft. Um, and obviously, I had to define good cards. In this particular measurement, um, I defined cards that top players have a win rate of 62% or more with. These are the good cards. Mind you, good players, like top tier players, they have an average 60% win rate. So 62 is just above the average for them. And I consider that a good card because it's over average for really exceptional players. 62% game and hand win rate is a lot. Uh, yeah, I slightly I, I did a slightly different measurement because here I had like a, an issue of comparing two different t player tiers. I assume that cards that are good for top tier players are probably the ones that you should be aspiring to play well. Uh, uh, so um, I took the good cards for the top tier players. But with Ragdos week one, you could see on average 21 of those cards per draft. Uh, and week six, that dropped to roughly 17. So you see four fewer cards uh, across um, uh, across uh, across the whole format, basically comparing week one to week six. Now, obviously, week one, Ragdos was crazy open. Week six, it's barely barely draftable. And the difference between those two things is four cards and a bit. Um, this shows you just how much small differences change the viability of a particular deck. And you have to keep in mind that uh, some of those cards that are really good, you probably won't play more than one copy of, and they generate the bulk of those numbers. So maybe if I would exclude those, those numbers would look slightly more impressive. Because, for example, Shallop's Ambush, you will see a lot of copies of those in every draft, but you probably don't want to play more than one. Or maybe you can play two, but no more than that. Um, and a couple of other cards are like this, um, where you don't want to play multiple copies of. Um, so I wanted to see um, what is the um, what is the difference in the win rate of particular cards between uh, between week one and week six. And here I look at the difference in the win rates for the bottom tier players between week six and week one. So everything that is above zero are the cards that are doing better in the uh, week six. All cards that are below zero are the cards that are doing worse uh, in week six. So they were doing well in the first weeks. And as you can see from the graph, most of the cards do worse. So actually, uh, the win rate of individual cards has, uh, has dropped. Um, so the cards that improved over time, uh, Lash of the Balrog, uh, Orkish Medicine, Haradrim Spearmaster, Torment of Golem, Warbeast of Gorgoroth, and Nasty End. The rest of them, they improved by very little, like Sirith Ungol Patrol, Smite Deathless, and Shell of Zambush. Um, these are cards that are not great. So they probably improved because they were just um, not good in week one, and now they improve ever so slightly because they are played as the 23rd playable. Uh, while in week one, they were probably a signal that um, uh, 
Rakdos was completely not open, and 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 then people who put them in the deck either didn't know what they were doing, or, um, or they were, um, or they were in the bad seat to draft Rakdos and still chose to draft Rakdos by basically forcing it. But a bunch of cards that are pretty good are dropping in win rate by quite a lot, like Relentless Rohirrim, the four mana four three that attempts you, eight percentage points drop in win rate. Um, um uh, Denlate Crabane, 7.1% drop in win rate. Easterling Vongard, 7% drop in win rate. Rohim Lancer, 6 percentage point drop in win rate. Uh, Quarrel's End, roughly six, 5% uh, drop in win rate. Rally at the Hornberg, uh, 4% drop in the win rate. So like really strong card, claim the precious drop by uh, by two and a half percentage points. So uh, really strong cards, they did drop in their win rate for the bottom tier players, which means that they probably just overdrafted at that stage and um, cannot replicate um, their win rate. Um, if you look at the same data, but for the top tier players, only three cards have increased win rate in week six compared to week one. Uh, one of them being Nasty End, uh, potentially because uh, you know if you don't have enough good cards, Card draw will get you the good cards. That's the sort of uh, philosophy behind it. Uh, Swarming of Moria, because it makes a treasure token and you splash more. That's exactly it, center roll. And uh, War Beast of Gorgoroth, uh, uh, because I think that the card is probably was underplayed in the first week. And uh, it's actually a better card than we thought. So probably the small increase, but the small increase of 0.8%. But a whole bunch of cards and all the good ones are um, are having lower win rate. Uh, Troll of Casa Doom lower by seven percentage points. Rohirrim Lancer six percentage points. Dunlit Crabane five percentage points. Rally five percentage points. Uh, Relentless Rohirrim five percentage points. All of those things just dropped in the win rate, despite those top tier players playing the deck much less. Because when you think about it, um, Top tier players started at 27% of their decks were Rakdos, and now only 16% of them are Rakdos. And still, it's probably overdrafted at that stage. So um, uh, this is something to think about. Also, it is possible that the first week win rates are just very high because it was so open um, that you could get whatever you want. Although when you look at this graph and you only see that the difference is really for four and a bit cards, um, good Ragdos cards that you see uh, uh, between week one and week six. Maybe you think those small differences are really more, more important than, um, than, uh, uh, than, than, than it seems from the numbers. Uh, top tier players are drafting is it right now, a Vampiric frog, frog, in terms of color combination. So um, here are some conclusions from those graphs. And like, first of all, pick one Dunlit Crabane is much worse than pick six Dunlit Crabane. And in first week, you could get this pick six Dunlit Crabane with some um, regularity. Right now, you will not. Uh, and the idea of that is that, and Dunlit Crabane is just an example, but I mean, it's the same with Rally of the Hornwork. If you can, first pick, let's say, Fear Fire Foes and Wheel Rally of the Hornberg, it's great. But right now you can't do it. You pick Fear Fire Foes and you will never see that Rally of the Hornberg again. And that is a big, big difference in how, um, uh, how your deck will operate. Being able to pick a good card that is a high pick because you know that you will pick a good card that is a late pick uh, is a big power in draft. Um, this is something I was talking with Marshall during the LR last week, that if I was presented with a pick of Smite the Deathless and uh, Rally of the Hornberg, I would pick Smite the Deathless because I think that cards are at comparable uh, power level and I'm expecting to see more uh, Rallies of the Hornberg later in the draft because they're going to be passed slightly later and I will see more of them that were opened uh, in, uh, in the pod. While uh, Smite and Deathless are picked quite highly, because of that, I have a smaller chance of picking them. And this is way more true in week one than it is in week six. Right now, probably the right choice is just pick the Rally the Hornberg because uh, 
you will have as good a chance of seeing more of those later in the draft as of my deathless and rally of the hornberg at the hornberg is a better card um, but first we gives you that advantage of look i can focus on picking those uncommons and um and maybe more mana intensive but powerful cards early and then i know i'm going to get my late denlet Crabane, my late rally of the hornberg and because of that i'm going to have a stronger deck now it's not possible and because of that I have to prioritize those Dunland Crabanes. And that means that I sacrifice my first pick, second pick to pick them. And then I'm getting the dregs in, in, in pick six, seven. I'm going to get my Orcish Medicines and my Snarling Wargs um, rather than, than you know, Rallies of the Hornbrook that I was getting in the week one. And that is a big difference. And um, that is hurting um, the uh, uh, Black Red deck in particular because that Black Red deck from the get-go, from the day one, was based on strict power of the cards. There's not much synergy in those black-red decks. Yes, you will have like some maybe two, three card interactions, but these are not synergistic decks. They are purely power. And raw power decks will suffer greatly uh, in later format when, uh, the, when, when the power is not there anymore because the cards are being picked as they should be. Um, so not seeing the good cards late means you either end up with a deck with weaker cards or you have to splash. And we saw that in the data earlier that the splashing rates have increased quite greatly in this format as it progressed. Uh, and both of those scenarios will decrease the win rate. So uh, having lower power cards in a power-based archetype is going to hurt it. Um, and at the same time also, week one, you're going to play with people who are playing for fun or who play very few drafts and their decks might be, you know, a bit more messy, a bit uh, odd choices, you know. Uh, you've seen a lot of uh, Mirkwood bats and uh, trebuchets in the first weeks, but you don't see them anymore because people figure out these cards are just not strong enough. Uh, so now you won't uh, uh, bump into those cards. Uh, and all of those things will contribute to the, uh, to the lower win rate. Also, people learn how to play around tricks and things like that don't work anymore. Right. Let's look at the same thing for the Izzet decks. Like, first of all, the decrease in Izzet cards, as seen, good Izzet cards as seen per draft, similar uh, graph as we saw in the, in, the, um, in the Ragdos section, it's also a drop. You saw roughly 30 good Izzet cards in the first week, and you saw, now you see 25. The drop is by five cards, but keep in mind, you still see more uh, good Izzet cards now, even than you saw good uh, uh, Ragdos cards in week one, when it was just 21. So to the part, Ragdos is and always was the most winning deck uh, as the format progressed, but actually you see more good Izzet cards from week one and still now uh, than you've seen uh, Ragdos good cards in the first week as per my definition, which arguably can be wrong uh, because it's arbitrary and every arbitrary definition has its dangers. We also see that, um, and this is the graph of the bottom tier players and how the win rates change. We also see that a bunch of cards have an increased win rate. Like remember in, um, in, in, in Ragdos, we saw that only few cards increased in the win rate and most cards said a drop in the win rate. And is it? Uh, we see an increase of the win rate for lots of the cards. And, you know, like by 10 percentage points, like in case of Pelagir Survivor, uh, which, uh, you know, became one of the key commons for the spells decks. Um, Erebor Flamesmith uh, increased by quite a lot. Weirdly, Ethelian Kingfisher increased. Uh, uh, and I think that maybe it's time to start treating this as a okay real card because... I think first week's Italian Kingfisher was picked very highly, so you had to sacrifice your early picks to get it. The same situation as the Crabane now right now experiences. But currently, people weaned off Italian Kingfisher and can pick it pick six, seven, and then it turns out the card is not terrible when you pick it late. Uh, so I think that this is one of the cards that late format uh, you probably should be more willing to draft and put in your deck. Uh, Rally of the Hornbrook, of course, increased in, the, in its win rate. Soothing of Smeagol, Fire Inscription, Gun of Sanction, all those cards increased in their win rate. Uh, because Izzet is not the same type of deck as Ragdos is. Now, yeah, we, we see some cards that dropped in their win rate. Uh, Bilbo, because its win rate was really high in the first weeks. 
here weirdly swarming of Moria is actually a lower um, uh, at lower um, a win rate, even though it was higher win rate in in Unractus. I still didn't get my hand around it head around it. But you know we see like smaller drops of three percent, two percentage points, except for isolation at Orthanc and Hithian knots, Hithlane knots. Uh, which drop uh, by five to eight percentage points, uh, those drops are quite small. And actually, you can see that as the format matured, is it cards start is it cards started winning uh, uh, quite more? When we look at the top uh, top player tiers, I had to split the graph because there is uh, so much uh, data in there that um, I couldn't fit it in one graph. I put all the cards that increased uh, their win rate um, as the format progressed in one graph. And we started with like Battle Scarred Goblin that improved the win rate by nine percentage point almost. And then we got like a bunch of cards Laurentus Rohirrim, Italian Kingfisher, uh, Rohirrim Lancer, Rangers Firebrand, Deceive the Messenger, uh, Gandalf, and Oliphant. These cards like increased by over one percentage point uh, as the format progressed. And we have a bunch of cards that barely increased, stayed at the same uh, level. We have important cards like Eomer, Fire Inscription, Bilbo, Birthday Escape. All those cards are as good as they were week one, uh, with other, some, some other cards that uh, increased by more. Book of Marzabul, um, Mazarbul, and Bath Song also in that category. And we have a few cards that dropped off their win rate. And actually, well, some of them dropped by very little, like uh, Rally. Um, um, Soothing of Smeagol, Smite the Deathless, and uh, Stern Scolding, and maybe even Glorious Gale. Uh, some of them drop by quite a lot. And uh, especially here, we see Swarming of Moria, Foray of Orcs, uh, Grishnak, uh, all those cards dropped, and Saruman's Trickery. Uh, all these cards have uh, a mass, and I don't know why a mass card would drop in, uh, in their power um, over the course of the format, but there is something about them, and it might be that you don't get high um, high density of them. Uh, another card that dropped off uh, a, quite a lot is Flame of Honor, 4.5% uh, lower win rate, but that win rate was probably very, very high uh, in week one, and that's why, that's the reason. And here we also see Pelagir Survivor, Survivor dropping at the top player's hands. And the fact that uh, we see Pelagir Survivor at the bottom tier uh, player's hands increase by 10.2 percentage points. And at, uh, for top players, it actually dropped by uh, roughly three percentage points. Shows you something about the nature of the uh, format evolution for the bottom tier players and for the top tier players. I'm pretty sure that this would mean that in the early format, Pelagir Survivor was um, used in decks that just didn't have enough spells maybe as a sort of like mill kind of win con and that didn't work so well as the bottom tier players learned that this is actually predominantly a spells payoff um they started playing it more correctly and 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 the win rate increase while the top tier players in from from the get-go wanted to play it as a spells enabler and it's just that um right now people are more aggressively killing it so it will not be unopposed um, um maybe the decks go under it and, and, and then you have to be forced to block with it and you cannot get the full value of it uh, or whatever. But for some one or another reason, uh, it, it, it's just uh, slightly weaker. Uh, Happy Problem says, uh, I've been thinking about Foray of Orcs as a good card. Maybe needs to reconsider. I think that this card is not as good as it was in week one. And I don't know exactly where to put my finger on it. But I think that lots of the cards are being played with Toughness 3. And it's hard to harder than in the week one to engineer those turns when you will make a 4-4 army early. So the impact of that card is just slightly smaller. Ah, Central. I think that that's like a very good assessment of it, uh, that Crebane into 4 happens much less. And I think that this is generally like the, the, the amass is good when you have a lot of amass and um, you don't get that much because the amass cards are quite heavily contested. Um, yeah, I, I, I had those moments when I had to play like Foray of Orcs recently and I had to play Shelob's, um, 
shell up the ambush in, with the trigger on stack because that was the only way I could kill something. And then it, of course, becomes much less uh, appealing when you have to do things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, still looking at those numbers, you see that roughly half of the cards increased in win rate and half of the cards decreased in win rate um, compared to um, compared to Ragdos where almost all the cards decreased in their win rate. Um, and I didn't make the slide where I speculate why that is the case. Uh, but my idea would be that uh, as Ragdos was the deck that was strictly based on uh, on this power level, I think that Izzet is a very synergistic deck. And because it's synergistic, you can get away with an um, exclusively common and uncommon based blue-red decks. You don't need any bombs. You don't need superpower. You just need all the cards to slot nicely to, together with each other. And yes, you will have stronger or weaker versions, uh, but there are a couple of different builds that you can pivot between. So even if maybe one version of the blue-red deck, like the strictly spell-based, is cut off and you won't get your um, Gandalf's uh, sanction slash um, fire inscription uh, build, you can still build a, a solid version that is based on uh, tempting with the ring and, and maybe some kind of tempo strategy, and it's going to be fine. Uh, Donut Slayer 808. Is there a time of a day week that you are more likely to face lower tier players uh, versus higher tier players? I usually play at this time. So you will face, if you want free wins in this format, especially for last week, this is the time to play, except Thursdays when I do the seminar. Uh, apart from that, there are some slight, Mm, slight variations, if I remember, for the win rate, but I would have to repeat it because I didn't do that analysis for like two years and things might have changed um, at that time. Weekends, I think that there's generally like, yes, um, uh, players that the weekend players are playing on the weekend and, and, and you might get some slight increase in your win rate. Okay, last analysis I did was I tried to look at um, impact of how early you have to take a card um, and um, and the change in win rate across the format. And I looked at it for all players. So I looked at uh, whole 17 land uh, cohort, basically. And I divided those into four categories. So uh, cards that lost the win rate between week one and six and were have had to be taken earlier at the same time um so this is the first category so this is the category probably the cards that had to be taken earlier and because of that also lost the win rate because if you take them early you cannot take other things and your uh, general power of the deck is going to slightly decrease and we start with two white red cards the shadow fax and eowyn fearless knight uh, they both dropped by roughly four and a half percentage points compared to the week one. And also they had to be taken earlier because they were more contested as cards. And here we see quite some good cards uh, that just basically became uh, drafted uh, higher than, uh, um, than the first week. So we see Fear Fire Foes, uh, Palantir of Orthanc, uh, Eomer of the Riddermark, Gollum, uh, Patient Plotter, Call of the Ring, Relentless Rohirrim, Dunlint Crobane, Sam's Desperate Rescue, Protector of Gondor, Nazgul, Rally at the Hornburg, Voracious Fell Beast, Smite the Deathless. All these cards were slot into Mardu decks, basically, um, and they all dropped in their win rate, and they all are harder to get um, as the format uh, evolved. So uh, this is the power. All those cards are very powerful, and this is why those power-driven archetypes are going to be uh, harder to draft in um, in week six compared to week one, because you just won't see enough power because they are taken earlier. And because of that, they will be, have to be heavily prioritized and you won't be able to get as powerful deck as in the week one. Uh, the second category of the cards are cards that probably were flukes in the first place. Um, they were not as good as they were supposed to be. And, um, and even though now they're taken later than they were in the first week, they still dropped in their uh, win rate. And here, a bunch of cards that probably you shouldn't be even bothered with. 
One card that maybe is worth noticing, Sauron the Necromancer, that dropped by 5 percentage points roughly in the win rate. Even though it was um, taken a bit later, people noticed that, you know, claim the firstborn is better than it probably. And because of that, despite of that, it's still um, it's still lost a win rate, uh, potentially because it was in black decks that were heavier, um, heavier challenged. Arwen the Mortal Queen, it's a good card, but first week it was just uh, having a crazy win rate. It dropped to uh, by four percentage points. Still, it's very high, um, but it dropped despite it being more available, be being drafted slightly later. And uh, another card that I think is important there, Theoden, King of Rohan. It's taken later, but still it dropped in the win rate, and that links to the Shadowfax uh, and Eowyn, who are taken earlier, but still also lose uh, more. And I think that, again, this is the price that uh, White Red is paying for Rally and Hollenberg being drafted earlier. Then we have cards that gained um, win rate, uh, despite having to be taken earlier uh, in week uh, six than in week one. And here, of interesting cards, Rangers of Ethelion. I think that the card um, um, the card was taken earlier because people figured out it was strong. And because uh, blue-red decks increased the popularity, I think that the win rate of that card increased. It became sort of like a, one of the few creatures in the blue-red decks. Bath Song, even though it was challenged more, it um, became um, it, it it increased the win rate by two percentage points. Uh, Arwen's Gift, um, uh, another um, draw card that um, that increased in the win rate together with the Bath Song. Um, what else do we have? Uh, Horses of Brunnen, uh, Soothing of Smeagol, two sort of bounce tempo effects um, in uh, most popular in blue red, obviously. Um, yeah, well, it, 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 it is that, that, that's why I sometimes play. So, um, Arstal writes, interesting that knots have a positive win rate while being one of the lower win rates among top players. Uh, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, you remember, you do remember correctly. Uh, that's why I sometimes split those things into tiers so we can actually have a bit more, um, uh, a bit more, um, a bit more detail, whoa, whoa, whoa. a bit more detail um, on, on on how those things look when you look more granular. Um, it probably also gained a bit of win rate in other archetypes than is it, uh, as opposed to uh, being slightly worse in is it decks. Maybe it's like better, for example, in white blue uh, whenever it's played, or white black especially. I think that hit lane knots are particularly good in white black because they slow down the opponent, and you have that inevitable strong late game in um in uh demir while is it is actually a deck that wants to finish the games quite early it doesn't have a very potent late game um yeah i'm sorry it's been a long day and it's been a long uh, seminar presenting like that being on my toes all the time is tiring um so yeah Despite being taken earlier, those cards increase in win rate. And here again, we see a bunch of those blue synergistic cards rather than strictly power-based um, uh, red and black cards that actually dropped in the win rate. So that goes together with that kind of conclusion that synergy-based driven uh, archetype that have those overarching synergies. I'm not talking about synergies when you need uh, three cards mixed together. I'm talking about the whole deck synergistically works toward a certain goal. Uh, these cards improve over time, uh, even if they are slightly more challenged, because every single card, if there is a broad selection of them, and there is an is it, um, it sort of still comes with enough playables to do it. Well, if you trim half of the power from the deck and you have to supplement it with not powerful cards, and there will never be, you know, like every card in the color is a banger um, situation those decks will suffer greatly. And, and there is a slide that's definitely missing there. But if I remember correctly, it was a very boring card uh, slide um, with cards that gained win rate and were taken later. And it was mainly scry cards because they had such an atrocious win rate in uh, first week because they had to compete with Ragdos decks that were power driven and full of removal and interaction. 
uh, those cards are slightly better in uh, week six because those Rakdos decks that destroy them are not as powerful anymore, and sometimes you will just manage to win. Right. That's all I wrote for today. And um, I would like to thank 17 Lands team, um, who obviously do an amazing job. So if you can, do support them. Uh, and if you want to improve very quickly, uh, listen to a couple of episodes that I have that strictly look at the uh, top players and, uh, and the bottom tier uh, levels. Try to position yourself. Try to you know realistically self-assess uh, where you are and use the advice that I get there because I, I specifically focus in those episodes on advice how to put minimum effort to maximize your win rate uh, using the data and how to focus on things that actually big, bring a big difference. Uh, also, I would like to thank Fake Jake Brown, who is uh, responsible for putting it out as a podcast um, and helping me with the editing and and advising me and and being a shoulder when I cry about um, um, uh, when I cry about my struggles as a content creator, uh, uh, baker, researcher, and um, father of the family uh, at the same time. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, and also thanks to Asesku and Mana Junkie who make the music for the podcast. Obviously, I would like to thank MTGA Zone for sponsoring and being very patient with my um, lazy butt who doesn't write because there is just no time. Uh, and I would like to thank my patrons, uh, especially the new ones, Francois, Kyle, Maxim, Andrew, who joined me this week. And uh, Despite despite my advice uh, ad, ad, advice from uh, being super exclusive and only having one patron, there is still space for more. Uh, so uh, if you want to join the patrons, please do. There are some benefits for that, including asking questions. And with that, I'll see you next week. <laughs>